All right, so we're going to begin our discussion about affine and projective planes. And the first thing that we need to talk about is what in the world we mean by either um, and both, eventually, of those two terms. Um, the first one is the word affine. So an affine plane is a model of incidence geometry satisfying the Euclidean parallel postulate. So I just gave you two models a moment ago that satisfied one the elliptical or elliptic um, and one the hyperbolic parallel postulates. So those two examples, geometry in a sphere and geometry in a disk, are not affine planes. But I also gave you one example that did satisfy Euclidean geometry. What was it? There's that one. There's another one I gave you. It was four-point geometry, right? We confirmed it. We did it with a couple of examples, but we confirmed that it worked. We took a line. We took a point knot on it. There was exactly one line that, that included it. Four-point geometry is an affine plane. The model of instance geometry that satisfies the Euclidean postulate, Euclidean parallel postulate. Um, we're going to jump back one more time into our game of set. The game of set is not an affine plane. So let's think about our game of set for a moment. In the game of set, we had Kelsey grabbed a set from the board, right? and there are cards on the board still. And on our next turn, we've put extra cards out, there's nine more cards or 12 more cards or whatever still out there. And all of a sudden now, um, Hannah and Matt both look at it and they say set. And they wanna use the same card with two others on the board that don't match. And it happened, didn't it? Maybe not with those three specific people, but it happened where all of you guys had, or some of you had, sets in your hand already, and the cards that were out there on the board are not in your set, they're not on your line, but they were in more than one possible set as the game continued. That's what it was. That would be a problem. That is not an affine plane, because that is not the Euclidean parallel postulate. There are many lines, many sets that each card could still belong to, that did not include the three cards in your hand. Game of sets, not an affine plane. The other um, de definition that we're going to look at is a projective plane. A projective plane is a model of incidence geometry having the property that any two lines meet and every line has at least three distinct points on it. I don't know why I don't have a bullet point for this, but we already talked about one of these. First of all, which parallel postulate is this describing? Elliptic, very good. Elliptic parallel postulate. Any two lines meet. Now let's set it a little bit differently. You know, the elliptic parallel postulate that I wrote down said parallel lines don't exist because every pair of lines meet. And we've also got this extra condition of having three distinct points on it. That wasn't necessarily inherent in our elliptic geometry, um, you know, definition. But our sphere would be one of these, wouldn't it? All right, if our points are all of the points on the surface of the sphere, then we've got at least three points on every line, and our lines are great circles, then every <coughs> two lines meet. So the elliptic geometry is a projective plane. I'm going to give you another model. I don't have the, card with, the cards with me. I'll bring them next time. 
But there's another game. Some of you may have played it before. Has anybody played the game Spot It? Okay. Hannah has. Anybody else? Okay. This is a fun game. Um, this is seriously like a game you should own because if you're ever with children, it's a really, really good one. Um, it is not... Uh, it's still an observational kind of game where you have to be able to observe things on cards. Um, but it has maybe less going on, maybe a little bit more fair across the board for all ages of people, whereas I feel like Seth's not necessarily like that. So we're going to, I'll show you the example of Spot It when I bring the cards in next time. So for right now, just write down Spot It. The Spot It cards live in my car. Um, we take them into restaurants because they're a good um, time filler when you're waiting for somebody to bring you food. Here's a note for us as we move forward. If we have a projective plane and we remove one line and all of its points, it will become an affine plane. So imagine, we won't use spotted as an example because I haven't actually showed you how to play the game, but imagine your sphere and you removed the North Pole. Once you do that, you will have an affine plane, which means the parallel postulate will hold from Euclidean geometry. The great circle situation won't happen. We won't have that issue anymore. So I'm going to show you next, let's see if we have enough time. I think we have time at least to start the first part of it. How we would actually go about taking an affine plane. I mean, we talked about taking a projective plane, we remove a point and it creates an affine plane. That's, that's how it works. But if you have an affine plane, it's harder to sort of add in the point and create the projective plane. So that's what we're gonna work on next. The projective completion of an affine plane. So we're gonna start with an affine plane. A. And we're going to define the relation tilde. So L tilde M, that's a relation on lines of the affine plane to mean either L is equal to M or they're parallel. So my first claim is that this creates an equivalence relation. I, you know, I could just claim that and move on and you probably would just say, okay, whatever. I don't know what she's talking about. Um, but that's actually something I'd have to show you is true. I can't just say that it, it creates an equivalence relation. So there are three pieces of information we would have to verify to know it really does create an equivalence relation. These are referenced in your book if you want to go back and look. Um, I'm choosing to show them to you as, as by way of an example. The first thing that has to be true, oops, those weren't supposed to show up at the same time. There's two of them there. The first thing that has to be true to be an equivalence relation is the reflexive property has to hold. That is that L has to be in the same equivalence class as itself. So just check it. Does L satisfy this description right here? Does L equal L or L parallel to, um, uh, to itself, L? Is that a true statement about L and L? But yeah, I mean, L is equal to L, so it's in the same equivalence class as L. Reflexive property holds um, automatically. Jane? Um, the reason this is happening is because of the way we define equivalence classes. For example, if we had defined this to be our equivalence class and it didn't have this on here, we'd have a problem because L is not parallel to itself. It's only because we defined the class itself, the relation itself, I, I think I said that wrong, the relation itself to include this piece. If that piece weren't included, we'd have a problem. Okay, okay? so we need that piece in our um, relation description in order to make this work. Now to answer your question directly, is there a case when L would not equal L? No, <laughs> there's not. But there certainly could be the case where L is not in the same relation. The relation doesn't hold for itself if we created it in a way that didn't work. This one's created on purpose to work. 
Okay, here's the second one, transitive. We've actually mentioned this before when we mentioned our logic descriptions that work, the idea of transitive. If L is related to M and M is related to N, is it necessarily true that L is related to N? And that requires proof. So we would actually have to prove three cases, four cases, excuse me. I'm going to write the cases down, and then we'll prove them next time. So give yourself maybe one line in between them. They don't let them take a lot of space, but they do actually have to be all proven. Case one, remember I mentioned um, one of our ways that we can prove something is by cases? So this is one where cases are really nice. Case one is the possibility that L is equal to M and M is equal to N. Case two would be the case where L is equal to M and M is oops, parallel to N. Case three looks much like that, but in reverse. L is parallel to M and M is equal to N. Those actually require very little work. Case four requires a bit more, so I'll have space for that when we come back next time. Case four is the case where the parallel exists for all three. L is parallel to M and M is parallel to N. So what we want to be able to prove in each case is that we still have this relationship at the end. Somehow at the end, L and M are this L and N are the same, or L and N are parallel. And if I can prove that, then I will have proved the transitive property, and we will pick up there next time.